We're filming today for the Hamilton Jazz Archive, and we're in California, and we're also in musician's heaven because today we have two giants of jazz music, Mr. Gerald Wilson and Mr. Snooky Young, who between them have accounted for some of the greatest recordings of trumpet music and also some of the greatest compositions and arrangements. And it's a real pleasure to have you gentlemen here. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. It's My a pleasure, pleasure to be here. Before the cameras were rolling, we got a taste of some history between these two gentlemen. And uh, I want to ask you what you're doing right now, though. You said you're busy. Yeah, I know you're busy. Actually, I'm just freelancing. Yeah. I've been out of work now for three years, but I'm not unhappy <laughs> about that. <laughs> you're filling in the time, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm with the Tonight Show band here <laughs> yeah, tonight yeah, and various <laughs> other projects, I bet. Sure, yeah. sure. Gerald? Well, I'm, uh, I've been out of work for 10 years. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm doing fine. I, uh, I'm going into my fifth year as on the faculty at UCLA, which I'm very happy about. I enjoy my work there. And uh, my band's doing just good. We play concerts. Uh, we don't play uh, all the time, but we play good concerts. We just played the Playboy mm -hmm. a few months ago, a couple of months ago. And uh, last year, this time, Snook and I were getting ready to go to Chicago to play the Chicago Jazz Festival mm -hmm. together. That was my band. And uh, we made an album in between, right, Snooky? That's right. And That's right. Uh, so I'm really busy. I'm That's doing great. really good. It's wonderful to, to see our uh elder statesman of jazz uh, really carrying it on and we're so happy to see you working out there like that. Uh, a lot of the, the musicians from of uh, your age have seemed to start so early. When, when we think about when, when you started playing today, the kids are still in high school and they don't know what they're going to be doing. Can you take us back to what got you started and when you really got out there? I think Snooky should go first because he was before well, me. I, I came from a family band. With, um, my father and mother uh, were musicians, and so uh, actually, I, when I went first went on the road, I, I guess I was about 13 years old. And I started playing way before then even. Mm -hmm. That was when I was able to go out and play. I went down south and I played with the band that I'm sure you know this band, uh, Graham Jackson. Yes. Eddie Haywood Sr. Yes. And uh, also Belton, Belton Syncopators. Yeah. Out of Florida. So now that was before I went with the, the band he just mentioned, Chick Carter's band. Mm -hmm. This was like 32, 33. But I was. I was just a little baby. I was just crawling around there. <laughs> Amazing. What an education, huh? <laughs> no, not, not really. I was about 13 years yeah. old then. Yeah, yeah, you were quite old <laughs> for playing out. Did you have to continue your schooling somehow when you say you were on the road? Well, well I did. I did. We had a little tutoring when we were on the road. Mm -hmm. And so then I went on the road for about, it was about a year. And then I went back home and mm -hmm. And I went back to Dayton, Ohio. After was out on the family was out on the road for about a year and a year and a half. I had some tutoring while we were out. That, but uh, I went back home and finished my high school education mm -hmm. anyway before I ran off from home with a band because I was anxious to get it. That's what we did in them That's days. Yep. I, I imagine you possibly did the same thing <laughs> in a sense. <laughs> Where'd your musical? Well, uh, uh, kind of like Snooky, my mother was a, a pianist. She played the piano. She played in the church and also played in the school. She was a school teacher in a little town in Mississippi, Shelby. And uh, she started me out uh, teaching me uh, piano when I was about six. Uh, however, uh, I didn't take too well with the piano at that no. time because my sister was an excellent classical pianist. Oh. My mother could play the piano and my brother could even play the piano. So I, uh, I wanted a shiny horn, mm -hmm. so I talked them into getting me a trumpet uh, a little later, Ron, when I was about uh, 11 or 12, and uh, stuck with that for a while, uh, finished 
grammar school uh, where my mother taught in Shelby. Uh -huh. And then I had to leave the little town to go to the nearest city that had a high school uh, that I wanted to go to, which oh. was Memphis, Tennessee, which was only 80 miles from Shelby. Mm -hmm. So I went to school a couple of years in Memphis, studying the trumpet and music with the professor there, Professor yeah. Love. and and uh, people at the Manassa High School, where Jimmy Lunsford was a teacher at one time, by the way. And uh, finished a couple of years there, and then uh, I happened to be lucky to go to the World's Fair in 1934, and I had never been north. And in, it was the, such a great difference in Chicago than it was in uh, uh, Memphis or Shelby. Uh -huh. And I, when I got back home, I just heckled my mother to death. I said, you must send me to the north. Yeah. <laughs> and she says, well, I can't send you to Chicago, but I can send you to Detroit, Michigan, mm -hmm. which was better because they had a better yeah. music school in Detroit than they did in Chicago. Oh. They had one of the greatest music okay. schools in the world in Detroit. I studied, uh, my trumpet teacher was Mr. Clarence Byrne who was the head of the music department. His sons were, were Bobby Byrne, who, who replaced Tommy Dorsey with mm -hmm. the Dorsey Brothers Orchestra at the age of 16. Wow. And his brother Don, who also played sax, they both joined uh, Jimmy Dorsey's band. And of course, I went on to Detroit, and that's how I, uh, when I got there. When did your interest in arranging and composing start? Was it about, was it early on? Yes, very early. My, uh, my quest to be an arranger and a composer started when I was a very small child, about 10 or 11. I used to sell the Radio Review in Shelby. This was a magazine, paper magazine, that had all of the radio programs that were going to be on. Mm -hmm. My brother was an avid uh, jazz fan. He graduated with, he and Teddy Wilson graduated together in the same class in 1929 at Tuskegee. And my brother got me very interested in jazz. So we would listen to Duke Ellington and Earl Hines and Claude Hopkins and all of the bands coming out of New York and Chicago. And I wanted to write music like Duke Ellington uh -huh. or somebody like that. And I wanted to do that at an early age. Snooky, can you tell us what it was like as a young man being on the road in some of the various bands that you started with? Actually, what it was like, hmm. I was so young at the time, I, I don't recall too much of it, to tell you the truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was with my family and we... Uh, hmm. But when you got out with... You know, oh, when the I, when bigger I, bands. When I went out with the yeah. bigger bands, well, the first big band I went out with after my family band was a, a local, I mean, a territory band out in Ohio, Chick Carter's band. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was it was fun going into that band because all the guys was, uh, they were all much older than me, and so uh, they kind of pulled me along, you know, because I was anxious and playing pretty well to play with a band like that, yeah. I think. I had the same experience when I played with the Wilberforce Collegians. I didn't go to Wilberforce, but I played with that college mm -hmm. band when I was still in high school over in Dayton. And, um, and so when I, um, well, when I went on the road with the bands, they kind of all, I was so young and so small, when I was, they kind of all kind of put me under their wing and yeah. kind of guided me along. That's great. That's the way I came along. What was the first? Um, group that you got to play lead with? Well, I was playing lead with this band that I mentioned, Chick Carter's band. And I learned how to play lead in that band because I really didn't want to be, a, I had no idea I was going to be a lead trumpet player because I wanted to be Louis Armstrong or uh. Gar Elridge, one of those kind of cats, yeah. you know. <laughs> and, but uh, when I went into Lunsford's band, well, out of Chick Carter's band, when I went in there, well, I replaced the lead trumpet player mm -hmm. in in Lunsford's band. His name was uh, Eddie Tompkins. Eddie Tompkins. I replaced Eddie Tompkins, and uh, well, then when I I think I that's where I started to really concentrating on playing lead trumpet, mm -hmm. and so from then on I've 
turned out to be a lead trumpet player. And so I kind of forgot being Louie or Roy or some of them other people, and I started concentrating on being a lead trumpet yeah. player. Yeah, but you got your licks in later on. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we got the records to prove yeah. that. Well, yeah. I, I got a few licks in, but I... I I still was happy. I, yeah. I think I was happier where I finally mm -hmm. wound up being a lead trumpet player than I did because all those jazz trumpet players, they was playing so much and moving along so fast. Mm -hmm. Here comes Dizzy, Charlie Shaver, yeah. <laughs> Joe Newman, uh -huh. uh, you know, so all of these guys, I, I just scratched the surface with the names I called in, you know. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it didn't disappoint me or anything because I just said, well, this is my niche. So I followed on yeah. into it, you see what I'm great. saying? I'm glad I had to, you know, wasn't frustrated in not going that way rather than being an mm -hmm. uh, out-and-out jazz player. Yeah. See. What was the first uh, significant group to, to play your compositions? Well, uh, you know, I, uh, I was around uh, Detroit. I was very lucky there to play with two or three bands in Detroit. I played with Hal Green's band, it was a nice band. Also played with a band called Gloucester Current. Gloucester was a great uh, writer, composer, mm -hmm. and arranger, and uh, he had a fine band, young band. Played with them for a long time. Milt Buckner and his brother Ted were around Detroit. Milt was doing a lot of writing, got interested in that real well there. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I, pl I played with that band for a while, and then I was lucky enough to play with the, uh, the Plantation Club band, which was the big nightclub in Detroit. These were all older guys, much older than I was uh, only about 18 at the mm -hmm. time. And they were all McKinney's Cotton Pickers, Benny Carter, Don Redmond. It's a very famous club. Yes, yeah. and uh, I played there for a couple of years or so. Wow. And then I read in the paper about this band, Chick Carter's band from Ohio. I knew Chick, he had worked there at the plantation as uh -huh. an entertainer, as a singer, mm -hmm. before he had the band. And I had read about these guys in the Pittsburgh Courier and the Chicago Defender. They had been to the Apollo. They were gonna play in Chicago and all the big cities. And, uh, I, and I said, I'd like to play with a band like that. And they needed a trumpet player, by the way. And I left and joined the band, and Snooky was in the band. That's when we That's met. That's the first time, huh? That's, That's when we met. This was what year? This is 1938, 39. 38. Well, even 38, huh? Yeah, I think it was 30, because 30. Uh, probably 39. Yeah, 39. Yes. Well, that's when we went with lunch. Right, but let's, let, let me put it all together for you. You know, <laughs> you know, I joined this band. I want to go with this band. I want to get on the road. You know, I've been in Detroit going to school since 1934. <laughs> This was 1939, <laughs> so I took the job. I quit this great job, by the way, the highest salary in Detroit mm -hmm. for, for a nightclub band, mm -hmm. and I uh, wanted to go join this young band, which I did. They were in Saginaw. Mm -hmm. And I joined them, and uh, we played the weekend, and the job folded. Oh, man. <laughs> the job folded. And uh, so I was going to go back to, D to Detroit, but I was ashamed, you yeah. know, uh, to go right back so, so fast, you know. So the guys in the band said, Gerald, why don't you come on and go, go to Dayton with uh -huh. us? <laughs> and Mitchell Same Wood face. and Snoopy yeah. and them said, come on and go to Dayton with us. And he said, well, I said, well, what am I going to do there, you know? So said, don't worry, you know, you, we'll have a place where you can stay and everything. It won't be anybody. So it happened. We, we took a taxi cab. We, <laughs> those were lean days. We hired a taxi cab <laughs> to take us from Flint, Michigan, no, from Saginaw, Saginaw. Michigan, to, <laughs> to uh, Dayton, Ohio. And uh, so we made the thing, and we went there. And while I was there, I was walking down Fifth Street. And I passed by the YMC. Is that right? That's right. In your hometown? That's right. And the guy ran out and says, Hey, what's your name? I says, My name is Gerald. And he's Gerald Wilson. He says, Okay, I got a wire in here for you. How so did that happen? Had, the YMC <laughs> had this wire, and it was a wire from Jimmy Lunsford. He said, Would you like to join my band? If you would like to join my band, call this number. So we were getting, waiting to play a date. We were going to battle Erskine Hawkins. Erskine Hawkins. <laughs> We're going to put Snooky on Erskine, by the way. We had Erskine's, we had him all ready to yeah. be chewed up by Snooky. <laughs> it makes no bones about it. And uh, 
at the moment, it was great because it was a great thing to see this because I would love to have played with that band. I, that was my favorite band. Mm. And uh, so I, but I love this little band of Chick Carter's. I said, I'm not going to leave this band. Wow. So we, we finally, the day came a couple of nights later, and we played this Battle of the Bands with Erskine Hawkins. And I knew Sammy Lowe and Doug Bascom and Jimmy Mitchell and Avery Parrish. I knew all of these guys. Over the years, I had met all the bands that came through Detroit for years. So I was talking with Sammy Lowe, the trumpet player. Yeah. He said, hey, Gerald, you got a wire from uh, Jimmy Lunswick. wants you to join the band. I said, yeah, I did. He said, what are you going to do? I said, no, I'm going to stay with this band. This is a great band here. They got some great musicians. They had Ray Perry and Step Harden and Snooky and Eddie Bird. Eddie Bird, Eddie Bird <laughs> all these great guys. Uh, Sammy Lowe says, look, Gerald, this band that you're playing with is breaking up as soon as they finish this job tonight. <laughs> said that Ray is getting ready to leave for Boston <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> so I said, really? You know, I didn't know all of this was happening. So I immediately went to the telephone and wow. called Jimmy Lunsford. Yeah. And he says, go down to the station in the morning and there'll be a ticket there for you and, that's and, in, and information what to do. And that's how I, how I left Dayton and then went on to New York. Six months later, he had Lunsford to set for me to join the band. All right. Right? Well, what, what happened, I'll get, let me get to you right quick. Uh, about six months later, Eddie Tompkins, the lead trumpet player, and this is very good for history, too, although it's, uh, we didn't know all of this was going to happen. I was singing with the quartet and the trio because I had replaced Cy, and I could do that. Mm -hmm. I had studied uh, all of that in school. And uh, uh, we were in Washington at the Howard Theater, and we were singing Ain't She Sweet, you know that number, the big mm -hmm. hit for the Lunchwood. And the quartet finished. Eddie was a member of the quartet. Eddie, Tompkins, Trummy Young, Willie Smith, and myself. That was the quartet. And when we finish, we always step back and we take our bow and in order, an orderly manner. I mean, like it was, everything was like a routine, yeah. you know. And uh, we all went back, but Eddie, the trumpet player, walked out the door. And we didn't see him. I didn't see him for weeks later. No kidding. <laughs> so they needed this trumpet player real fast. Yeah. And, uh, and Snooky was the man. Snooky was the man. A few days later, Snooky walked into the theater there at the Howard. Where did you go with Snooky? Yeah. Huh? That was playing with jail those few months. I know that was the cause of it. I know you must have talked to lots of me. Well, I just told him I knew this trumpet player that could really play the trumpet. Uh -huh. I told him he was one of the greatest uh -huh. trumpet players I'd heard that he was just a kid. Uh -huh. And he could, as I said, we put him on Erskine Hawkins. Erskine Snooky could already play double B flats then. We <laughs> featured him on his, I mean, could really play the trumpet. Yeah. He was a marvelous trumpet player at the time. You and know, that competition thing and that battle of the bands and the, the jam sessions, and I don't know if that happens nowadays, but th that must have really inspired players. And, uh, it did. You know, made you play better than uh, you thought maybe oh, you could. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You probably played better than you ever played when you ever run across the band. You remember that battle we had in Washington, D.C. Yeah. against uh, but, uh, Gene Krupa? Yeah, and then uh, all the back, we had a battle with, uh, with uh, I think it was uh, Andy Kirk one night at the, at the, uh, at the uh, Golden Gate Ballroom. Golden Gate Ballroom. But uh, the Lunsford band was so yeah. tough. Uh, like we weren't worried about any band. Yeah, we just uh, weren't worried about any band because we didn't even bother to take out our music to when we played the Battle of the Bands because you only play, you know, you play your set. And we wouldn't even have any bandstand. We'd just come in and do our thing. If you'd notice the Lunsford band, they had a rack for the trumpets. They had trumpet, flugelhorn, and the little French trumpets. They had all, oh, they were, they were a tough band. <laughs> They, a lot of people don't know that, but yeah. Lunsford's band was one of the first bands that had flugelhorns in the hmm. band, I would say. Yeah, and the little French trumpet, well, which was made, it's made like a French horn, uh -huh. but it's a B-flat trumpet. B-flat trumpet, that's and right. And they played those. They, they, they did everything. They had the glee club in the band. They had a quartet, trio. And the first thing you do when you join the Jimmy Lunsford band that day is go and get measured for seven outfits. Wow. 
the shoes. So it wasn't everything there. was like you know. That's like that. It had to be right. Yeah, and they could I wore the wrong socks one day <laughs> and got a fine. Oh, yow. <laughs> I got a fine. I never wore the wrong socks again. <laughs> he loves us to look down at He said, I think we had on white suits, maroon socks, yeah. with maroon tie, uh -huh. and maroon boot and hair and yeah. handkerchief. Yeah. I think I had on the wrong socks, and he saw that with them white shoes. <laughs> Gotcha. Wow. <laughs> That's amazing that some of the other fellows have been talking about the difference in band leaders, how Ellington was not, you know, that strict, oh, I guess, yeah. uh, <laughs> to put it nicely. Yeah. But some of the others, yeah. like you say, yeah. wrong socks cost you money. Uh, yeah. Uh, um, what is, tell us about your first big band and, and how that came about. My first big band? Yeah. Well, uh, what happened was, I, it, it happened by, oh, I had intended to be a band leader. Mm -hmm. uh, from my, so those early days of selling the radio, review, I used to make my own batons. I thought for once I was going to use a baton in the early days, mm -hmm. but I never used a baton, mm -hmm. by the way. But uh, it happened, by, I was out of the Navy, I just gotten out of the Navy in 1945, and uh, Herb Jeffries, the singer, had been with uh, Duke Ellington and uh, Earl Hines. He was going. He wanted to get a band. They wanted him to front a band for this new nightclub mm -hmm. in Los Angeles here called Shep's Playhouse. So they said, "Well, the guy to do it is get Gerald, because Gerald's got music." I had plenty of music yeah. because I was writing music for Jimmy Lunsford before I left him, and then Benny Carter. I wrote music for Benny Carter, and Les Height, which Snooky was with. We were with both of those bands, mm -hmm. and uh, so I had plenty of music. So I said, well, you know, in those days, arrangers did those kind of things, you know. The guy, you'd write a guy a whole book if he wanted it, you know. So I was doing it for the money, of course. Yeah. And at the last minute, I got the band together, picked the people, put them together. Herb's going to front the band. I rehearsed them and everything. And Herb, something came through for Herb, and he decided he wasn't going to front the band. So the guy told me, he said, okay, Gerald, you take the band, come on into the club. So I went on into Chef's Playhouse mm -hmm. with a band, and that was it. Wow. Yeah. Did you have to get a different singer for that? And a singer? You, yeah, or just you just go with a, the band? At that time, uh, uh, he was going to be singing, of course. And, right. And, uh, uh, but uh, they had other singers. It big show and everything, oh. and there were lots of singers around. I see. During those days, there were a whole group of singers that traveled around. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that it wasn't hard to get a singer. Now, didn't you work with some other singer later on? <coughs> some guy that used to be a winner. Yeah, and that, that happened with my band, of course. We were, Snooky was with me at uh -huh. the time. We, we were together, you know. Snooky and I, we played with Les Heist Band here, Los Angeles. We played with Phil Moore. We, we, we made uh, records with everybody. We played for Warner Brothers, MGM. And for movies. Yeah, in the movies. We, we were doing it all. Yeah, CBS, we yeah. were... For, with Meredith Wilson, uh, who, who had the army band go, thing going there, but he had this band we used to go. So we were always together, uh, Snooky and I, playing with these different uh, bands. And uh, in 1945, when I organized, it only took us about six months. I was in Salt Lake City for 13 weeks with my band at this biggest nightclub there, broadcasting. So we, we made it real quick. We went over to Chicago, we went to Dallas, St. Louis, and came back to Los Angeles. Was that when we went to the Apollo? Yes, we went to the Apollo Theater What's in 46. Was that 46? 46, yeah. we went to the Apollo, we played the Apollo, then we came, went to Chicago, we played that 10 weeks. Well, the last two weeks... At the El my, Grotto? Now I, yes, at the El Grotto. I didn't have a singer, so my... my, my Male singer, uh, some, he had to go away and had mm -hmm. to leave. So he said, well, what are you going to do? The guy that owned the club was Harry Fields. He said, listen, there's a guy here named Joe Williams. I said, well, yeah, I know Joe Williams. He used to sing, well, I didn't know him personally, but yeah. I had heard him sing with Lionel Hampton's band. And uh, so I knew that he was a fine singer. So he said, we can get Joe Williams. So he got Joe Williams for us. Joe came in and finished the two weeks at the El Grotto. Then we went directly from the El Grotto to the Club Riviera in St. Louis, 
where Ella Fitzgerald was the was the main was the top drawer, and it was my band, and I had Joe singing with my wow. band. That was a six week engagement, and uh, we were doing great. Joe was singing; he could sing all the numbers we had. He was a fine singer then, and he could sing the same numbers that the guys. That that helps, right? Yeah, he, have could, to he could sing all those numbers that the guy that was Dick Gray. That, yeah, yeah Dick, that was Dick singing. Gray, yeah. So uh, we had Joe with us, and Joe loved it. He loved it, of course, being there we with Ella Fitzgerald. Wow. I remember we battled our band and, and Joe. We battled Louis Armstrong's Louis Armstrong. band and Ella Fitzgerald. You know, and like wow. it was like this all night long. I think you should explain a battle. How did that oh, work? This you know, it, look, battle doesn't really mean I know, anything. but it's did not you play like a song? Tyson and those guys. Did you play a song and then they played a song? No, or was it a no, set? No, and a, and you play a set. You yeah. play about an hour. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. About four hour engagement, we would play about an hour, yeah. hour, hour, right. hour, hour. That's right. the way it would yeah. be. And but it, the people would, you know, they was there to see who was going to blow who out. Yeah. You know? yeah. That was the whole idea. Yeah. And, uh, but the musicians weren't the thinking musicians that way. Musicians weren't like yeah. that, but that but that's when they say a right. battle of bands, they, right. it was for the public. You know, the public be looking for, just like a ball game uh -huh. or something. You know, wow. It was that was a great band. I loved playing in that band. Cheryl's first band. That was your first band, wasn't yeah, it? Right, yeah. right, right. First right, band. Yeah. Gerald could range Gerald could rehearse a band better than anybody mm. I ever played with. Down through the years, I used to love the way he rehearsed a band, and I played with a lot of them. You know that. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> but he was the best. What, was Joe doing? Uh, what kind of stuff was he doing at that time? Was it? He wasn't singing the blues. Yeah, I'll tell I was you that. Ask. He yeah. should have been singing them then, <laughs> because that's he. That's, he, that's his niche. I mean, yeah. uh, let's let's face it. Joe Joe Williams is. A, uh, he's, he's one of the great blues singers of the time, but he also sings a fine ballad too, yeah. you know, and fine jazz songs right. too. Joe's beautiful. You know, I would like to, for you to remember when we were with Lunsford's band and we would go into the Regal Theater, yeah. and Joe Williams was the stage. I mean, didn't he? Didn't, wasn't he working in the theater? I don't Do you know. know. The first time I saw him, I, I man, think it that's was the first Lionel Hampton that I remember. Oh, Joe I think this from, is before he joined Lionel. Uh -huh. I didn't he know used, that. He used to tell me I that he used know. to be backstage when the big bands would come in. Yeah. He said he was so thrilled when Lunchwood came yeah. in, yeah. and you and I was his. Right. We were the same age. Right. Uh, he got a uh -huh. year on me, uh -huh. and maybe six months. Six on months you. on you, <laughs> huh? Yeah, my birthday is coming up in a couple of days. I'm talking about uh, Joe. Joe Williams. Yeah. He's got about a year on. We all about the oh, same that's age. Right, Joe, that's what that's I'm saying. Right. Joe yeah. Williams. Yeah. I think we're we're the looking same at the book there. Except for about 39, six right? Yeah. 39, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's fascinating how uh, the musical chairs that were going on, you know, people moving from, from band to band. And tell us how your, your tenure with Basie well, I quit, I quit Gerald Wilson's band. No, I quit Count Basie's band to John Gerald's band. And the That's guys, saying something there. The guys couldn't understand that. Yeah. That was in the, was that far? <laughs> they said, where are you going, Snook? I said, I'm going out in California. You go California for what? I said, I'm going to join my friend. He's got a band, Gerald Wilson. They said, are you kidding? You're going to leave Count Basie's band? I said, well, we was roommates and close friends in mm -hmm. Lunsford's band. I said, I'm going to join his band. Wow. And that's what I did. I left Count Basie's band to join Gerald and stay with him for, I forget, three or four years. Yeah. Before I, I was back during the war time, too. I got caught up with the war, although I was fortunate that I never got, they found me physically fit and I never had to go in. I never heard from a draft board no more. Wow. <laughs> that's the truth. I wanted to go to Great Lakes where this guy yeah, was. We were, we were Everybody was him. up at yeah. Great Lakes. We had it all fixed, ready for him to come uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. I was. <laughs> I thought I was going to Great Lakes because Willie Smith was up there, yeah. Clark Terry was mm -hmm. there, Clark. Jimmy Nottingham. Mm -hmm. Oh, you you can name all the guys was up yeah, there. Marshall Raw, yeah. Ernie Raw. Yeah, well they but they came out here. See, Marshall, they, that band started there. They they put that band together there, uh -huh. and then they came out to St. Mary's Pre Fright oh, in, in San Francisco. That's yeah, right, that's right. Yeah. You spent uh, two or three periods with Basie, right? Yes. 
mm -hmm. one of which was pretty fairly long. Yeah, uh, well, the first time I went in bassist band was right out of Lunsford's band. I replaced Buck Clayton. Buck Clayton had to have his tonsils out. I was had left base. I had left Lunsford, and I was in my hometown, just in between whatever might happen. And so they, they, they needed a trumpet player to replace Buck. So I went in the band for a month, and replaced Buck. And so when when Buck came back, I went on back home, mm -hmm. and then I went to California, to John Gerald Wilson and no, Lee Young and Lester Young. I went to California to join that band. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like playing in a small band, so I sat around there for about a week and rehearsed with them. I said, no, I don't like playing in a small band. I said, I want to go with, Gerald was over there with Les Height's band. <laughs> and so I went over with Les Height. And we was happy. That's what, you know, yeah. we were. We were roommates and everything uh -huh. in Lunsford's band and everything. Yeah. Anyway, you know, we were just like that. So that's how I, let's see. Uh, but we even went from that band to Benny Carter. Benny Carter, but took a whole trumpet section. Yeah. Wow. Let me, let me tell him about that. You tell him. Listen, you know, you tell him. we were with Les Heist's band, which had good, he had a good band. You must remember Les Heist had been to New York City already. He had Gil Fuller writing for him. Mm -hmm. Dizzy Gillespie had played in his band. They were a very good band. So when, they, when, I, when I joined him and Snooky came out and he didn't want to play with a small group, so Les Hyde, we'll take Snooky on with him. Well, after we left Les Hyde's band, Benny Carter needed a trumpet player, so he called me and he says, Gerald, I want you to join my band. I knew, knew Benny from New York. I used to talk with him all the time, go around here, his band rehearsal over on Lennox. And uh, I had seen his band that he brought to California at that time. And I says, well, Benny, I, I tell you what, you need a tr one trumpet player. Why don't I just bring you four trumpet <laughs> players? <laughs> no kidding, the whole section. So he says, OK. J.J. Johnson was in the band. He had, a, he had some good, but he needed a trumpet section. Mm -hmm. And we could just play anything that they had and could play it right now. And we went into Benny's car and Benny Carter's band, like, wow. shot from here to here. <laughs> That's right. From right here to there. That's right. And we went in there. We See, the trumpet player that he had, I'm going to tell you, the, I, I remember it was Miles Davis. Was Miles in there? Wow. Right? Miles was one of the ones he wanted to let out. Uh, the boy that married uh, Sarah Vaughn. Yeah. What's yeah, his name? Yeah, yeah. What's his name? Yeah. What's Sarah's his name? husband, first husband. <laughs> used to marry, used to Sarah's manage her. Husband. Yeah. What's the name, Josefina? Yes, George, George Treadwell, Treadwell Miles Davis, more about music and I can't I think of the other two, but the, the whole trumpet section, he was unhappy with it. Benny was unhappy with his trumpet section. Yes, he was. And that's how, that's what Gerald oh. said. Well, it was Fred Trainer, yeah. uh, Williams, Walter Williams, Walter Williams, yes. Gerald Wilson, and that's myself. Sweet, right? That was the trumpet section we took into. Benny Carter's band. And also, if you'd like to hear that trumpet section on film, you can hear us in This Is The Army with a 60-piece Warner Brother Orchestra wow. with four trumpets, and we are those four uh -huh. trumpets. That's right. Great. Yes. I'm interested in, um, if I saw my dates correctly, you were with uh, Basie for six or seven years at one point, and then you left and you came in? No, this, isn't that know. funny? Who do you think? When I joined Count Basie, mm -hmm. who do you think I was supposed to replace? Mm -hmm. Snooky Young. <laughs> Snooky left the band. Uh -huh. <laughs> they were here at the place someplace. <laughs> and uh, Basie called me, and they says, uh, Snooky uh, had to go back east, Gerald. And uh, I played a couple of days with him at the Lincoln Theater. See, I think you left because they didn't have a trumpet player. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I went and played a couple of days at the Lincoln, and uh, so basically said, well, look, Snooky had to go, and he's going to rejoin us when we get to Chicago. You come on and go to Chicago with us, and uh, then Snooky will be back. I said, mm -hmm. fine, you know. So uh, I left with the Count Basie band, which I loved. I and mean, let me tell you, uh, that was another great day for me to be, to be able to join a band like Count Basie, because I was going to get a chance as a writer to sit 
where swing had really started. Mm -hmm. And remember that there was the original rhythm section, which they called the All-American All right. Rhythm Section. It was Walter Page, Joe Jones, Count, and Freddie Green. So I, for, my, for me, that was going to be another education deal because I'm going to sit here now as a writer. I can just observe really what's going on and what's going on with this swing. Because you must remember the, the Count Basie band and Count Basie in that rhythm section, they're the ones that put the word in the really meaning into swing. Mm -hmm. All bands had to change to that type of rhythm section. All bands. The Lunsford band would have, would, would have had to change, which they had to. Duke Ellington, everybody, if you're not playing this type of rhythm, you are not into the newest form of rhythm that would finally take over the world. And because you must remember that bebop had no, no rhythm of their own. They had to use that same kind of rhythm uh, in their uh, first efforts. So it was a great day for me. Uh, Basie had more in mind, by the way, because when we got to Chicago, Snooky didn't show up. <laughs> you didn't show up, and I was, you know, I thought I was going to come back home, uh -huh. but uh, he had other ideas. Yeah. He, had, he he was also he also needed a writer at yeah, that time, right. and I was the man. That must have been a thrill. I was the man. Is it possible to put into words what? that rhythm section did that well you know you remember joe jones was an innovator into drumming mm -hmm. joe jones was real innovator he had some things going that drummers had not been doing walter page had been one of the first to start the walking bass Before, other than playing yeah. playing the the Two root people. and the fifth mm -hmm. in other words boom 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 and in the earlier days they just played the one note boom 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 so uh, Paige started walking on the cards, more or less. And then, of course, Jimmy Blanton came in a little later. But it was all, and Freddie Green, who, who had, you know, nobody can play the guitar rhythm guitar like Freddie Green. That's right. To this day. That's right. To this day. He never bothered you about know, a solo. When I left out of Lunsford's band, getting back to what he's saying, I went directly into Basie's band. And those two bands was night and day. I mean, Lunsford's rhythm was a two-beat rhythm thing, you know, and it was great and all like that, but you come out of there and move into Basie's band, I almost felt like I didn't know how to read music because everything was laying so different. Especially for a lead trumpet, right? That's so, right. Because you got to be... That's singer. right, and I had to learn how to play with Basie's band because I, well, can you explain that better than I can? Because it's very difficult, you know, because well, you asked a question to kind of hit on that. And I left from one band into, and went directly into this band, mm -hmm. this swing band, what you're saying. And I noticed a difference. In, but Lonzo had great rhythm and everything, but it was a two-beat rhythm. And so most bands was playing two-beat. Yes. Not like Lunsford's band did, though. Wow. Yeah, yeah Lunsford had the two-beat. They, they had the two-beat. Yeah, Lunsford's they had band. the two-beat. But they had to get that, you know, to play jazz, the ultimate jazz beat is when you're playing 4-4. Four, four. Yeah. You, it's the it? ultimate rhythm. And they had this thing. Joe had it going here. He had it going here. And uh, it, it was the thing that all bands needed. And still to this day, I mean, you, the band you play with now, all bands, you got to have this, whether you playing bebop or not, you mm -hmm. know, or whatever. So it was a great education there. I would like to tell you I was very lucky with that band because, as I said, Basie really had plans for me to use my pen. Uh -huh. They were going into Carnegie Hall for the first time. Excuse me. And he wanted new music because he had played, uh, he wanted the new sound. Mm -hmm. And I wrote, uh, I had eight numbers on his first Carnegie Hall uh, concert. That's great. Also, uh, at that time, he, he had a big show. We started it in Chicago at the Regal. I had to write all of these production numbers for, for the chorus and all of that stuff. Chorus girls they had and dancers and stuff. And uh, had to write all of that stuff for his, uh, for his band. They played it on Broadway for 16 weeks. And uh, 
then they did a lot of recording for me, which had just come out, you know, a few weeks ago when my daughter brought me these new CDs. Wow. I was worried about these things would never be heard. Uh -huh. And uh, they are out now on CD. So I, I had a great uh, time with Bass's band. I loved his band. I really, I was with him when he disbanded. I was actually with yeah. Count Basie when he disbanded. Was that because of the economics of the time? Yes, yeah. yes. I foreseen it coming. That's mm. why I split. And, uh, really, <laughs> <laughs> that's the truth. I thought that I seen it coming in California, and I split. They didn't know where I was, cause, but I had gone home. I mean, I'm a youngster. I didn't pay it no attention. I oh. said, well, I'm going home, you know, <laughs> pack my bag. Back to, was it Dayton that you went back to? Dayton. Yeah. <laughs> and stayed for 10 years. Almost a mistake. Almost. <laughs> Almost a mistake. I got out just in time. Yeah. I will say that. <laughs> I got out just in time. Because if I'd have stayed another two or three years, I would have lost the desire to get back yeah. into the fast company. Yeah. You see? And it wasn't easy coming back, I tell you that. What was the first fast company you came back into? Count Basie? Yeah. <laughs> and that was when he was the hardest. Yeah. yeah. I mean, his new, his next trip around, the, right. the comeback. Right. Joe Williams was in the band, yeah. man, you know. Clark right. Terry. And, uh, it was Clark And, uh, oh, that was Thad Jones, Joe Newman, Wendell wow. Collier, myself was the wow. trumpet section. That's Henry a Coca, Al Gray, and Benny Powell was trumpet, the trombone section. Mm -hmm. And the Reeds was Marshall Royal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Baritone, Charlie Charlie? Folks, mm -hmm. Frank West, Frank Foster, and Billy Mitchell. <laughs> Billy Mitchell. And uh, the rhythm section was, of course, uh, Freddie Green, uh, uh, Jones, Jones, Eddie Jones, Eddie Jones, and Sonny Payne, and Count Basie. Mm -hmm. And that was his next bad rip. I mean, bad band. And I think. Yeah, I think this so far as. Compared to the, his other band, people used to try to compare the bands, but I was in both of them, and I don't yeah. think it's fair to compare either yeah, one. They're both great. They yeah. both they're great. both great. They really were. That yes. other band with Prez and all of them, that was a great band. Mm -hmm. really? But that next one he had, he was basically was a lucky man, cause he he had some of the greatest saxophone players I believe to come along. Yeah. The sound, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the sound. Like, uh, First was he had Lester and um, that's the boy's name. Herschel Evans. Herschel Evans. Yeah. Herschel Don Evans. Bias. Buddy Don Tate. Bias, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lucky Thompson. Lucky Thompson, <laughs> yeah. He had an, always had great, great always had, had they always be. great tenors, right? For Paul the first Gonzalez. Yeah. And he had a great lead alto player. Yeah. Yeah. Earl Warren. Earl Warren, yeah. People don't yeah. you can't just, Earl Warren, they smile they used to call him. Yeah. He used to play right. any smile while he yeah. played. <laughs> He was great, man. He sure was. was. He really was. He what was. was Basie like to work for? Was he a... Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I, I was lucky. I lived in Count Basie's home with him for about eight weeks. All you had to do for Basie yeah. is play. Mm -hmm. yeah. Play and go to, He would let you kind of mess up a little bit, but not too much. He didn't want to be, you know what I mean, like cats, some guys uh, overdo it and drinking and yeah. whatnot. But he'll let you go on and do that because he liked to taste himself a little bit, you mm -hmm. know, from time to time. But he didn't want you to mess up and everything. So yeah. He was pretty flexible. Yeah. He was a nice guy. I love Basie. Yeah, too. He's a uh, wonderful man. That's marvelous. Wonderful man. All the, all the sporting life people love Basie, too. The, the racetrack people and all of these kind of people, the right. hustlers and whatnot. They all he, love Basie. He bet on the racehorses <laughs> all the time. He loved the game. Wow. <laughs> they all love Basie, man. They have a, yeah, he, did you get to go um, overseas with him? I didn't get oh, to yeah. go he overseas did. with him. I went overseas. I bet you did. I made a command performance with the band. We played for the Queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think uh, that was the only time that the, well, well, I mean, that was the only time. I think the band did a command performance. That was in 59, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Now, that was great. That was something. To play before, to be asked to play for a pup, command mm -hmm. performance, you know, to go through the whole ritual of it is really something. As an arranger, when you were trying to decide who gets the solos, you know, was there a certain, the was best, that your responsibility or was that? 
Yeah, that's well. It's your responsibility as an arrangement to give the solos to the best players, yeah. <laughs> to the best solo. Yeah. Because if you give it to anything less, is it's good, you know, it's not going to do your arrangement any that's good. Right. But if you got two great tenor players, you know, well, it's, you really don't have much of a problem. Yeah, I guess not. Not at all. No lack of talent. They might get mad at one another. I was going to say, you know, is there a little competition for solo space? I'm just saying solo that, that, space that doesn't happen. But yeah. I said, yeah. but you never know what's about. A guy might say, I wish I'd have had that solo yeah. or something, you know. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, that's just where the cookie crumbles sometimes. Yeah. Wow. Let me uh, move on a few years. And uh, Thad Jones, Mel Lewis mm -hmm. band. How did that whole thing come about? Well, that band came about with a bunch of musicians in New York that was do all mostly doing studio work. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Thad and Mel come up with it. I don't think, it, I don't know exactly who came up with the idea. Connors, some guy named Connors. Uh, I'll think of his name. He was a, anyway, they got the idea of putting this band together and they get all the guys that wanted to just play for, you know, instead of just playing the studio music all the right. time. So that's how that band formed. Mm -hmm. And we rehearsed for any hour of the night or any time. The guys would just show up because they wanted to play what Dad was writing and everything. And so finally they got a, they got a gig down at the Vince Vanguard and we did it every Monday night. And so that's where that band went from right to there. But it was just guys that wanted Must to have play. Been crowded in there. <laughs> yeah, because they got everybody was in the studios yeah. and things in uh -huh. New York. I can name I can't even you know the guys that was in the band. Yeah. Pepper Adams. That's uh, great. Jerome Garnett, Richardson. Garnett Brown. Yeah. Was Benny. In, uh, Benny Powell was in the band, wasn't he? Was Benny Powell. Yeah. Benny for Powell was in it for a short while. Mm -hmm. But the, at first the trumpets the trombones was Quentin Jackson. Yeah, that's right. Man, I, that's a shame. My, my mind is closing up on me. I can't call these guys' name now. Well, uh, Jerome Richardson. What's that trombone player's well. name that the Mingus hit in the mouth? Oh, Nepper. Jimmy Nepper. Jimmy Nepper. Yeah. Jimmy Nepper, but yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's, that's terrible. <laughs> I was working. Yeah. I was working yeah. with him when that happened. Oh, really? Wow. Oh yeah. I was. We was working on some kind of concert for, uh, for uh, town a, hall. Concert. Town hall concert. Yeah, I remember that incident. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I was yeah. working with him. We was rehearsing yeah. every day. But one day, Jimmy never came in. He came in for because he didn't have some music written or something. That's terrible, man. Yeah, a trombone yeah, player. That is terrible. I hate to put that on the wax, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's true. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, a pretty yeah, well told yeah, story. Yeah. Um, when you settled in, in L.A. later on, you got into some. Well, actually, some other... yeah, I settled in L.A. when I came out here, when I left Lunsford's mm -hmm. band. I settled here then. I've been yeah. here ever since. And your writing has taken you. Taken me a lot many, of different many places. places. I, I've been lucky. I've been lucky. I've written for practically every band that there was a, that you can imagine, and uh, I, my dreams have all been really. I've, I've, uh, all of my dreams have come true. I wanted to write for people like Duke Ellington. I wrote for Duke, and uh, wrote for him even when, uh, up until the time he was down. I was still contributing numbers. Uh, I wanted to. I did. Two, con two concerts at Carnegie Hall with Al Hurt, uh, who Snooky was on the band, and J.J. Johnson. We had all those great guys there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I wanted to write for the movies, and I've written for the movies. I wrote to, for MGM, Where the Boys Are, Love Has Many Faces over at Columbia, uh, uh, Ken Murray's Hollywood, My Hometown. I've done TV work, everything I've wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to write for the symphony orchestra. And one day I got an invitation to write for the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Wow. I composed a number that they, uh, they performed, and then I later orchestrated uh, six other things for them. The Zubin Mehta conducted all of my numbers. So my, all of my dreams, more or less, uh, have been answered, although I'm still writing today. Mm -hmm. I'm, in fact, I've been, I was writing yesterday, as my wife can uh, attest to. 
and I intend to write uh, until I die. I love to write, and I love to write things that nobody else has heard before. Yeah. <laughs> I believe that I can create, I can write music, I can do it any way I want to now. And uh, uh, so my dream is like Snooker's, has been as a Snooker's greatest lead trumpet player. I told him he was going to be, by the way, I told him he was going to be the greatest lead trumpet player in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when he said, no, he wasn't, you know, but I knew well, he was. Well, we got to hear just about, so the, I, the, the country got to hear it just about every night for all those years, yes. you know. We, uh, I mean, with the, the Tonight Show and the, can you, uh, any particular experiences on that band that, um, funny incidences or during your tenure with uh, that mm. TV thing? Mm. Something you'd never, rather not remember. Everything was just so smooth so far as yeah. I was concerned. Yeah. I, I, I just don't remember. <laughs> I can't recall anything. It just went. To, it was just like clockwork the way yeah. that show. It, we only they would put it together and everything. It was just very seldom anything went wrong over mm -hmm. there. Funny thing. But here's a funny little story for you. I was in, uh, this was with the Count Basie day. Uh -huh. I was with um, Basie and uh, Sonny Payne and I used to hang out after the shows and everything is over. We was playing the, the pier there. And uh, Sonny Payne, was, we was in the bar and Sonny Payne got a little tipsy and he had a brand new Chrysler Imperial. And so I said, Sonny, you done drank too much. You better let me take this car on. So he was said, okay, Snooky. I took the car on home. The next day, Sonny <laughs> got up and didn't know he had given me the keys to his car or anything and reported his car stolen. <laughs> oh. <laughs> really, and I was driving to work. I was driving to work the next day, and the cops pulled me all oh, over. Oh, man. And I had on the count base a uniform and everything. And they said, this car is reported. I said, stolen? I said, I didn't steal this car. I said, this belongs to the drummer in the band. I said, he was too high last night, so I'm driving this car. They said, we're taking you to jail. We don't oh, believe it. No, they okay. took me to jail. And that's true. First yeah. time I was ever arrested. <laughs> and so they called Count Basie. Yeah. And Basie uh, told him, said, yeah, that's my... So they let me out. <laughs> and so I get back to the the show, I missed that show, but I played the second show that got me out in time for me to play the I'll second show. Mm -hmm. After the show was over and was getting ready to leave out, Sonny and I was going out to get out, out to have a good time again. And Basie saw me and Sonny leaving the theater <laughs> and he said, Hey, Snooky, yeah. ain't you had enough of Sonny Payne yet? <laughs> I said, He's right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. <laughs> I hope it's not still in your record. <laughs> <laughs> he, he did do that. He did. Yeah. You know, he, well, you know, he didn't know where his car was. Too. Right. <laughs> um, well, this has been a marvelous conversation. I know you have to work fairly soon. I think. Yeah. Right? And uh, any anything else that you'd like to to add before we wrap up here? I think we about have we about covered everything, huh? I we could probably so. do another hour, uh, but it's it's. Uh, I've got to thank you guys for the for your music over the years, and it's it's great to see such camaraderie and the um, with the stuff you've created. I'm very happy to be friends with this guy for so many years, and we're still friends, and he's still producing music that's greater than ever. I have to say that. And I love playing his music, and I always have, always will. And he's still writing, man. He's something else. Gerald Wilson is something else. <laughs> right. Really big man. This is my friend. Yes. Thanks so much on behalf of Hamilton Jazz Archives and Gerald Wilson and Snooky Young. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you.